I'm Dave Chichura, head brewer at Oscar Blues Brewery in Longmont, Colorado, and you're watching The Beer Diaries. Buddy. Hey, how's it going, man? Welcome to Oscar Blues. I'm Tim. I'm Greg from the Beer Diaries. It's awesome to be here. Oh, well, great to have you. It's a beautiful day. Yeah. Welcome to Colorado. I want to try some beers. Well, you guys, let's do this. You guys, you guys got some, I bet. We have uh, quite a bit. <laughs> awesome. So, let's check it out. Let's do it. Well, welcome to the Tasty Weasel. That's what you see right here. That's the name of the tap room here. The tap room right here. Tasty Weasel. Don't ask me where that came from. <laughs> As you can see, this tap room is right in the brewery. Yeah, I mean, the, the tanks are right there. Tanks I mean, the, right there. The people may notice a little noise. There's canning. You guys have a massive canning line, like, right there. It's a full sensory experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. One of our sellers right here, because we have quite a few. Yeah, And yeah. then uh, this nice long bar, and you can drink and see everything in action. Yeah. So that is a lot of grain. That is a lot of grain. We uh, store super sacks. We have a silo of grain in our back. Wow. We have uh, some 55 pound bags that will come in for uh, like specialty. specialty grains. You name it, your roast, your crystals, your all other cereals like your wheats and rice and oats that we use in some other styles too. You can see the super sack system right here. So that is uh, like just how, a, how heavy are those things? Uh, about a ton. A ton. So I, I believe uh, one sack is about 1,600 pounds, and the other sack of a, a crystal malt called caramel yeah. is about 2,200 pounds. Wow, it's just denser. That'll last us about a day or two. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. amazing. And you got the mill over here. Yep. So, so this is where the, where the grain gets basically cracked. And yeah, once the grain comes, drops in, either from the silos out back or from the super sacks, or even from hand loading 55 pound bags too, the grain will run through our mill. It's a four roll mill. So we got two sets of rollers to help thoroughly grind every pound of grain. And grain from the mill heads up into this grist case, and from this grist case, shoot the grain up to the mashing. All right, so then the brew house is right around the corner here. Right around the corner. This is our JV Northwest four barrel, uh, four vessel system. However, one vessel came from a Pacific Mechanical. Okay. Right now, this thing is turning out about 50 barrels of brew each time. Wow. And every two and a half hours. All right. This is the whole brew house area. Yeah. So everything starts with the mash louder done. The grain coming from the, the grist case shoots and drops in right here. This will hydrate the grain and it will drop into the mash louder tun. The port receiver will help us hold the, uh, the work until it needs to go to the brew kettle. Okay. The boils are about 90 minutes. Our pilsner is about 75 minutes. Okay. And then after that boil, we're gonna add hops it up to about three different times. Cool. After that, it transfers to the whirlpool yeah. and spins around for about 10 minutes. That's to clarify and take yep. the trouble. Get all that trube and all that hops get out of the solution. Yeah. Make semi-clear work before we finish up the process, cool it down, and shoot it to a fermenter. The last stage of the brew house process happens right down yonder because we're going to cool down our work. We're going to do it as quickly as possible to avoid any formation of off flavors. All right. This bad boy right here. The big box under big there. Big box is stationed and crammed in there. You can cool down that work in about a half hour. Wow. That is so how, many, how many gallons in a half? 1,600 to 1,700 gallons pulled down from 200 to 53 to 67 in a half hour. Wow. We'll oxygenate our work. Uh, okay. And we'll also inject yeast in the stream. Okay. So we're monitoring the temperature. We're injecting yeast. After we inject the yeast, we'll start oxygenation. Like this is the only time you want to, you want to oxygen. Other times the brewing from here on after yeah. this, kickstart the yeast and then no. Yeah. Oxygen is a horrible thing for beer, but a good thing for work yeah, at yeah. this one stage. And the cellar consists of a gigantic <laughs> number of huge tanks. 
Yeah, if anything from 100 barrels to 200 barrel tanks, right. 40, 43 tanks in total. Wow. Yeah, yeah. No, there, it's, it's quite a sight. I mean, it's one of those things that once you actually see it in person, you're like, yeah. there's a lot of beer in here. Five years ago, when I got here, we only had 900 barrel tanks. Yeah. Now we have 43 total, mostly 200 wow. barrel tanks. They yeah, got some barrels going. Oh, yeah. Barrel aging is ever expanding. Anything from bourbon to wine, port, uh, even some rum casks. Too. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Direct from Jamaica. Cool. And so that's becoming a bigger part of what you guys, that's probably still small release yeah. batches though, I expect. I mean, it's definitely gotten bigger, but it's just a small little sector of what we're messing around with. Yeah, yeah. And now we're getting the world of cans. Yes, Can Island, Can Mountains right here. Yeah, yeah. So we got our 19.2 cans, we got our 16 ounce cans, our 12 ounce cans. They are pretty gorgeous looking too. We and definitely just... like to take care of our vertical space here. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, here we are at the, uh, the bird's nest, crow's nest, uh, way up high the brewery. Depalletizer is where the entire packaging process will begin. It just uh, takes them off layer by layer. Kind of like it pulls them off carefully. Yeah, Maybe. Right, exactly. Cans will then begin their long journey. All the way down through here, and in straight line, all the way to back down there towards the filler. Right. At the filler, it will uh, take the cans after it rinses them, and it will purge the cans with CO2 and actually bring it up in a tight environment, purge the cans once more, create a counter pressure environment, fill it up right away. So no oxygen, really almost, almost no oxygen. Like yeah, at this point, you know, we don't want any oxygen yeah, yeah. whatsoever. After the filler, you, uh, you get that great fob on top. So a nice little foam, but it moves pretty quickly. Get it from a uh, filler, you got seamer, get the, uh, get the cap on, and then the seam, there's a double seam, a crimp, so it rolls over. Absolute steam, no air in, nothing comes out, and then move it on to the next process. Right now, the can of, this can of beer is made. We'll go ahead and print a little born on time. Yeah, I say time because it is down to the second on that bottom of that yeah, can. That's amazing. So we can track to see how the entire factory performance went. Yeah, yeah. You got a nice little uh, crazy saying on the bottom. And uh, it will vary every single time. Yeah, well, that, that gets us to the end. I mean, the beer's in the cans. I think it's time to try some. But I mean, really we appreciate try some this beer. tour has yeah. been amazing, man. Exactly. It's a really incredible place. Hey, folks, I'm Greg from the Beer Diaries. I'm here in Longmont, Colorado, a very special place. I am at Oscar Blues drinking beer from a can. I'll tell you that right now because these guys are the ones that are really brought to the craft beer industry. I'm here with Dave Tachura, the head brewer for all the locations. We'll talk about that. Um, thanks so much for having us here. Yeah, thanks for being here, man. We're, we appreciate it. We love visitors. Yeah, thanks. I, Cheers. I, I feel a little inadequate with that. Uh, well, I'll make do with my, my little yellow pills. You guys have been growing a lot. Like, you've been here for a while. Uh, last two years, what's it been like? Has it just been a whirlwind? Yeah, it's been a, pretty much a straight shot uh, directly upward in, in, in everything that we've been doing. and. Uh, you know, it's been that way since before my time with, with the brewery. I started with Oscar Blues uh, a little over eight years ago. Yeah. And uh, even, you know, well, even well before that, it was an established, you know, freight train moving along. And Were you in the, originally at the Lions location? Yep. Yep. Started out there in 2005. Uh, There's still probably at that point maybe about four or five people involved with with the brewery. So real, it's a real small operation at that point. Mm -hmm. How many barrels were you doing back then? We did, we did 5,000 barrels that first year. Which itself, that's a pretty good, that's a big, decent number though, too, yeah, right? Yeah, not too bad. It was, you know, definitely established. You know, we started brewing in, in uh, about late 1998. Yeah, It was yeah. just like a little brew pub thing. Yeah. And then to kind of go into, into production, more of a production thing within a few years of that. And uh, yeah, it, it, it kind of moved right along really quickly. <laughs> And um, how much are you brewing now? Like, how many barrels are you guys, like, this last year, how much did you do? Yeah, well, we did 80, about 86,000 barrels wow. last year. And, uh, so 2012. And uh, now that we have not only this production brewery, but also one in Brevard, North Carolina, we're on pace to do uh, about 130,000 wow. between the two plants this year. So, I mean, folks that follow the craft beer business probably know that there's a, um, so this list of the top 50 volume brewers, and uh, brewers by volume, and you're kind of in the middle list already, like yeah. in 28, 29, somewhere in there. Yep. I mean, this is gonna. Yeah, it's crazy. When we first started hitting the numbers like that and see ourselves like in the top 50 of craft, and yeah. now in the, somewhere in the top 50 of brewers, period, in the U.S., it's yeah, it's it's really uh, kind of strange. So, what is it that uh, you think 
you know, created this growth. I mean, I think one thing you know, from a craft brewer's or craft uh, appreciator's perspective, like Dale's Pale Ale is a must drink beer. If you've right. never had it, it's one of those beers you have to have. Um, it's in a can, so it's kind of a bit unique, but I mean, it's just an incredible beer. Was it? Was that what got it really got you guys pumped up or? Yeah, I mean, part, part of it was the can. I mean, that's what initially people probably knew us about and they thought it was probably a gimmick when in reality it was done because you know, Dale learned about the fact that cans are actually a better package for beer. Right, right. But I think what helped to get Dale's Pale Ale, that particular brand, out there more was uh, happened back in 2005 with a uh, an article that came out in the New York Times where they uh, they did a, a blind tasting of 24 American Pale Ales, and uh, that's what kind of put us more into the national and international. Uh, you know, consciousness, I guess. So prior to, being, prior to being the head brewer here, you'd worked at a, a few different places, like, I mean, you've been brewing for how long professionally? Uh, since 1996. Wow, so just a few years. A few, yeah. I mean, it's, and it's still, I still every once in a while I will think how, you know, strange it is that I made that happen, you know. I mean, it all started, I was, I was a home brewer. I started home brewing in 1994. Yeah. Really luckily for me, it kind of just happened kind of naturally where I was working at, the, at, the, at a, the kitchen in a little brew pub in Indianapolis called the Broad Ripple Brew Pub. And uh, the brewer there uh, told me one day, he said, hey, I, t I just talked to the guy who's going to be brewing at the Rock Bottom downtown. He's looking for an assistant brewer and was wondering if I could recommend anybody. I thought of you, do you want the number? Oh, that's awesome. And I said, for sure I do, and <laughs> took it from there and yeah. bugged the hell out of that guy until he gave me a job. Awesome. And so that's kind of where it started. I, I don't have a formal education in brewing at all. Uh, but, probably, you've done it, but you've done it for a year. I mean, it's, uh, one, of those, it's yeah. one of those things that I think it's, it's, education never hurts, but yeah. experience is king, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, not, not bad for a uh, college dropout who, uh, <laughs> you know, mostly move pianos or landscape, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, and so, uh, you know, I discovered beer and it was something that I'd never been more interested in anything before yeah, yeah. or since. And so Dale, and correct me if I'm wrong on his name, Katechis? Katechis. Katechis. I, yeah. I was close. So, so Dale started it. He was the founder. Yes. And the recipe was his. Dale's Pale Ale was yep. his? Was yeah, it's based on a recipe that he was uh, brewing back in the... Uh, back in college at Auburn University. Yeah. You know, Oscar Brews itself really started out as uh, just a grill and brew, uh, or a, 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 a bar and grill place pub, up, yeah. in, up in Lyons, just uh, outside of Boulder, Colorado, and uh, in 1997. Did Dale ever tell you the secret of where the name Oscar Blues comes from? I've heard many secrets. All right, well, let's, let's hear this. The yeah, Oscar I mean, Blues name, I think <laughs> fans want to know. Everyone remembers the Blues Brothers movie. Okay. You, know, you had Jake and Elwood Blues. Yeah. Dale was at a, um, was at a garage sale or, a, or an auction uh, at some point, um, about the mid '90s, and uh, and came across an original script for the movie. Oh, and you're kidding. It, I had initially, a sale. initially in the script there was a third blues brother, and that was Oscar Oscar Blues. And so, kind of like one of those things that never made it to the yeah, uh, to yeah, the to the yeah. final gig, and, and was dropped. And, and uh, I hope he bought that script because that's, that's pretty oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, so that's where it came from, and you know, and. and Specializing in live blues music up there yeah, yeah. still to this day. There's a lot of blues music going on up there. Live music, they have live music almost almost every night. So one of the other things that's kind of interesting. I mean, your shirt kind of reflects this a little. Um, being outdoors, sort of, I would, maybe a bit of extreme sports, but certainly a lot of mountain biking and biking. Like For you guys, sure. you guys even have a, have a bike company. Yeah, a couple years ago, uh, Dale decided. He's been an avid mountain biker for you know a very very long time. Yeah. And around these parts, uh, there's some amazing mountain biking. You know, up in Lyons itself, there are uh, numerous trails and just amazing uh, you know views to, to, to see if you know if you're uh, willing to put in a little effort and yeah. pedal on up the hill. And so uh, Dale a couple years ago started a bike company called Reeb. Reeb. Uh, beer spelled backwards. Yeah. And. Uh, they're 29-inch uh, hardtail, uh, belt drive, single-speed bikes. Yeah, I saw the belt drive on one, mm -hmm. like, I mean, around here. It's, it's, a, it's the coolest thing. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's pretty, pretty wild. Yep. So as far as the, 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 the growth here, I mean, one thing that's pretty amazing is consistency. Like, you guys, what kind of stuff do you guys do for the consistency and quality of the beer? I mean, you guys just, I put out great beer after great beer. you got a really great lineup now. Like, Thanks. As, as the sort of head brewer, what are the sort of things that you have in place that make sure the beer stays super fresh, super tasty. You know, it really all started back when, uh, you know, when I started is just trying to be consistent with getting your gravities right, you know, pre 
fermentation and post-fermentation so gravity. So, you, so you, your word is what you think it's supposed to be? Make that as consistent as possible. Uh, you know, just you know, really strict cleaning and sanitization measures. That's maybe the, the more boring stuff. Uh, but but important, us, that's important stuff, though. That's, it, it's, it's uh, I mean, it's key, and that's, that's you know, if you don't have a, a solid foundation of cleaning and sanitization and repetition, then you're probably not going to be a very successful brewer and everything's right. going to come out differently every time. Uh, that, in addition to, we do daily sensory panel on, on all beers that are in process. The folks uh, will taste them, us that panel folks will be like, yeah, this is consistent. And share their ideas on yeah. it. And, um, you know, because we are, we're craft brewers, we're, we're batch brewing, we're not doing any major amounts of blending right, for right. consistency. So, you know, we, got a, we have a 50 barrel brew house yeah. and we do two to four brews per batch, depending on what size fermentation tanks available. And 90% of the time, that go, that batch goes through as just a single batch. Yeah, it's not yeah. blended with anything else. Other improvements that we've made, I mean, you know, speaking to consistency and quality, we just recently automated our brew house here in Longmont. This was up until last July, it was still a completely manual really? brew house. Even uh, at the size and scale you guys are at. Like. At 50 barrels and, and, and just the uh, logistics of it all. I think you guys did a tour earlier yeah, yeah, and yeah. saw it's a lot of running up and down stairs and yeah. around this and over that and yeah, yeah. reaching in there. Yeah. That's all been eliminated now. It's That's all awesome. done off of the touch screen. We have certain processes that are uh, like a, a single button uh, thing that will activate a whole series of valve movements. And um, that was valve movement. <laughs> and, uh, as, and as well uh, as thanks for Pam pointing that out. That's important. <laughs> as well as uh, if it triggered the other, that'd be weird. Uh, <laughs> that uh, we're we're able to also have some uh, automated controls on uh, some uh, temperatures and things like yeah, that. Yeah, so we yeah. have more consistent mash temperatures, yeah. more consistent uh, 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 knockout temperatures as yeah, well. Yeah. So hopefully speaking to more consistent beer in the, as a final nice. product. So I mean, other stuff you guys do. There you a bunch of, of some brew pubs around town as well. I think there's there's a uh, the hamburger Place was also an Oscar Blues brew pub, which has a gigantic can sitting out front. Yeah, so right down the street from here is a place called Oscar Blues Homemade Liquids and Solids. That's our <laughs> restaurant and beer bar. We have, I think, 44 taps of beer wow. over there. Uh, yeah, so a full-on restaurant, live music there several nights right. a week, huge outdoor patio area. Well, and the meat comes from your farm. It comes from our farm, it comes from the Hops and Heifers farm. So so there's a so there's a farm that you guys provide spent grain to. Yeah, it's an integrated sort of sort of thing that we feed the cattle. A portion of their feed is from our spent grain from right, our right. brewing process. We, we also do some composting out there. Okay. So we have uh, peanuts in the shell here yeah, at yeah, our tap really, room. Yeah. All those peanut shells go back out to oh, the farm, wow, cool. get composted. And those end up on uh, on top of the hops that we're growing out there too. We yeah, have a two acre, two acre hop farm out oh, there wow. as well. Yeah, we're gonna swing out there a little later. We're gonna uh, take some footage out and there. The hops are sprouting right now. They're coming Are they sprouting? Up. Yeah, they, they, I think they strung up a bunch uh, just a few days ago. Have you have you had uh, beers made with their hops already? Is this month multiple yeah, we've years? Yeah, this will be the third year for the for the hop crop. Is there anything special you like do as far as celebrate when they're actually your own hops, like a? You know, say in the, in There's the a ritualistic room. goat slang uh, <laughs> that we all participate in. Roast or we have a blood orgy. And, all right, right, uh, right. Yeah, I mean, which I think is traditional. Then ride mountain bikes. And, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. It. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we go out there and get some people together and go out and harvest the hops and pick them by hand and and uh, get them uh, get them dried and yeah. or leave some fresh and get those into some beer as soon yeah, as possible. Yeah, yeah, well, that's, so, that's, that's yeah. That's pretty amazing. It's, it's, it's a good so, time. So one more question I had too is this the overall philosophy. Of, of Oscar Blues, it's really bold. It's, it's an aggressive in a good way. Like you guys have a, is there kind of a philosophy of how you run things? I remember, like you know, we saw a dude riding through here on a skateboard. Historically, mm -hmm. had like basketball courts and all kinds of stuff in here. What what is it about the culture or the the philosophy of, of, of the company? Well, I mean, it's been put very succinctly um, through a, a slogan we have on the Reed bikes, which is. Uh, uh, ride bikes, drink beer, go fuck yourself. And in <laughs> that, a good, a, in a good of, way. Yeah, that kind of su sums up the... In, in a good way. Well, it's, it's just about, I don't know, for us, really get her done, have fun, yeah. enjoy where you live, yeah. enjoy a beer, um, get out, ride a bike, yeah. uh, go hiking, go skiing, go, go, uh, go uh, Take advantage snowboarding, of the place go you fishing, live, right? do, yeah. do whatever. I mean, you know, that's what we enjoy out here. Uh, Dale's a huge proponent of getting people off their asses. And you know what uh, term that I throw around a lot is like earning your beers and yeah 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 you get out there. Well, I find I find that like the tap room here actually. So there's a tap room in the brewery called the Tasty Weasel. Yeah. 
uh, it is like literally right in the brewery. Like, yeah. you know, we came in today and it was, the canning is just like across the wall and it is it's loud. There. Oh yeah. Behind it are all these fermenters. And it's a really cool, like really cool atmosphere in there. Like it's, people, people like it a lot. And, and uh, that was, you know, when we started here, we, we didn't have a, a formal tasting room the okay. entire first year that we were here. People came in, they wanted a tour, we'd show them around. They wanted a beer, we pulled one off the, the can line. And <laughs> like literally, they, they get to read the saying. And, mm -hmm. yeah. and we'll chat for a little while. And so we, we added that about a year later. And uh, yeah, it's great. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a nice thing, really, you know, a place for employees to hang out after putting in a good day's work and yeah. go down and hang out have a beer, enjoy the fruits of your labor. So you guys are at the forefront of the canning revolution. Like, mm -hmm. you guys were, I think, acknowledged as the first craft brewery that really put beer in cans. Right. Like, what was that like? Like, was it everyone thought you were crazy? It was that classic sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, so, for the record, I wasn't there when, when that started mm -hmm. myself. I was... Uh, Which I'm sure you've heard how... What it absolutely. Was, yeah. No, for sure. And, and it was... Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it got a lot of a lot of talk, a lot of chatter out there about it. People were so probably surprised. I, think, I mean, there was that point where cans were kind of considered low class, or for, and, and they still are to a lot of people. There's still a lot of people who don't really know about it. I mean, it's come a long way. Yeah. Uh, but by the time I started with Oscar Blues uh, in 2005, so about three years after they, uh, we started canning beer, there were maybe about a dozen. Yeah. at that time I and so it was Scott still was, very, very small. pretty early Scott was right on our heels yeah and uh, yeah actually last year we just uh, did a, our first collaboration beer with them in celebration of our 10 years of, of canning oh, awesome. which was pretty much like their that, 10 yeah, years yeah. of canning as well they were just right a little bit uh, a little bit on our heels there and so we uh, brewed up a batch of beer so how many states are you guys in like how broad are you getting I mean it's kind of changing I probably think we're in 31 now okay uh, we just opened up uh, a, a few states over the last uh, over the last year. Got into uh, Ohio and, and Kentucky. I think last you guys are year. up in Canada now a little bit too. We like are a little bit, like sending I've, some beers up to Canada. I've, I've seen some um, Dales up in Canada, which yeah. made me smile. So, yep. so what, one thing about um, you mentioned earlier about Oscar Blues and blues music in the, the, the Lions location. Are there a lot of local blues artists that, that, that do stuff for you, for you guys? Yeah, or? yeah, for sure. You know, a lot of that, a lot of bluegrass around here as well. Is there a lot of bluegrass? Cool. A lot of, you know, uh, folks who, you know, some Americana yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you know, just, you know, just like real, a lot of roots music yeah, kind of yeah. stuff. Let's flip to beers. Um, I'm guessing probably Mama's Little Yellow Pills first. That's a good one to start with. I'm happy to pour it. Yeah, if you could pour that, that'd be awesome. And where'd the name come from? Now we're going to talk about each one's got very unique names. What are, where are these names coming from? Yeah, Mama's Little Yellow Pills. Dale is uh, really good at naming beers. Okay. And uh, so, you know, when we did that original batch in Lions, yeah. that was, uh, I, told, I cool. could Thank not you. come up with a name for it. And uh, I remember walking into the office, downstairs office there one day, and Dale looked up from his desk and looked at me and just said, Mama's Little Yellow Pills. <laughs> and and you were like, like, all right, like, You done. brilliant bastard. And, uh, well, some people have that skill, don't they? They're yeah, like, yeah. If you, you know, have you ever heard, uh, you know, the old Rolling Stones song, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mother's Little Helper, uh, you know? So this was, so I've been drinking this, and it's, I mean, again, classic, super clear, lovely, mm -hmm. light golden pills. Yep. A little hoppy, I mean, nicely oh, hoppy. Yeah, yeah I mean, no, sort of, definitely, no. We, Really, this this beer uh, is right on the heels of our pale ale for yeah. sheer uh, amount of hops in it. Yeah, uh, they're they're uh, very low alpha, but pound for pound, I mean, there's almost as much hops in the right. uh, in the pills as there is the pale ale. Very nice. So I mean, like I mean, like on the nose, uh, like a little bit of like you know the obviously the, the sort of the floral type hops, and then a bit of the graininess, and then yep. finishes. Really nice, little bit of bitterness, malt's holding it up really yeah. well, grainy. I, I drink this beer more than anything else we make. It, it is our most sessionable of our regular beers. It's 5.3% ABV. Yeah. It does have a bite to it though, you know, for a pills in, oh. the, in a good way. Like, yeah. I mean, you're not, you're not, uh, you're not getting a light, a light, a light weak beer with no, this at we're, all. We're, we're, we didn't set out to make a training wheel beer. <laughs> this is probably our most accessible beer. Maybe, you know, yeah. I mean, but it is. I mean, it does have, a, you know, a, a, a certain degree of bitterness. It's all Czech sauce, hops all the way through. Czech sauce, yeah. And, uh, you know, pretty simple grain build to it. And Dale's, of course. It's Dale's is no slouch at uh, 65 IBU. Wow. That was, the, that was a kind of a, a range for IPAs not that long ago. I mean, it's kind of gone up in the last while, but it's... Well, it's, and it's, it's an atypical American pale ale, and, you know, we, we call it actually and eventually, I'm hoping that it does become a true style, is a Rocky Mountain Pale Ale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 
you know, so it's it's definitely bigger. It's 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 bigger in uh, in stature than than your standard American pale ale. But really and great, really great citrus and pine on the thanks. nose. Like, and I've always said it's it's a dry hopping away from being an IPA. Yeah. And the fin I mean, the finish is so good on this. Like it just there's just a bit of malt sort of dancing with the hops and the bitterness and you know floral and, and piney like yeah it's nice I mean, it's got it's got a pretty substantial body for it i mean yeah, you know, the yeah. 65 ibus are there but you don't feel like you're being beat over the head with it yeah it's um, not overly bitter at you all you don't you know it doesn't it doesn't uh, strip taste buds off of your palate it's uh, it's it's pretty well balanced thing but what's next what would you do next believe it or not we're going to go uh, good night because oh, interesting. the deviant would probably blow out your hop sensing capabilities. Where did the name Gnite come from? Well, this is a this beer actually used to be called Gordon, um, and it's a uh, it's a beer that we that we brew in honor of uh, a guy named Gordon Knight, who is a uh, Colorado craft brewing pioneer, got it, Vietnam vet um, as well, and uh, he. Uh, he, he died fighting a, a forest fire wow. just outside of Lyons back wow. in 2002. Okay. And, uh, you know, this beer's brewed in honor of him. Uh, we had to change the name, unfortunately, but uh, his, his, given his last name was Knight, uh, yeah. we went ahead and call, so called it Gnight instead, uh, instead of Gordon. And, uh, it's, it's Imperial it's Red, great. right? This is our Imperial Red IPA, and this is universally everyone's favorite beer uh, who, who works at Oscar Blues. It's Dale's, really? favorite, it's Dale's favorite beer. Well, it's like pine, 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 like, and citrus and yeah. some tropical, sweetness. There's yeah, great like, malt in there, a little bit of tropical fruit. Yeah. Its flavor really belies its 8.7 percent alcohol. It's a little as well. bit of warming, and it's got a nice body, though. You mm -hmm. know, it's kind of got this fullness to it. You yeah, know? like not, a, not 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 excessive or sticky or anything. But no, it's, like it's nice pretty and damn full. drinkable considering where it starts pre-fermentation. It finish is fairly dry but not but it but it's yeah. got enough malt in there to kind of soak up some of that alcohol so what do you do next i mean after this we have like still straight up ipa and then the imperial ipa yep. Gubna, like i'm calling it the audible right now and we're yep. going to go Gubna uh before the, the deviant dales wow. and the, the reason for that is and you'll find out here in just a minute when you try the deviant is the hop aroma on it is bigger than anything else that we make and this was big, right? Like this is like a this is this is the biggest uh, year-round beer that we make. It's 10% alcohol, right? 100 IBU. We just actually just recently switched up the recipe a little bit and uh, changed the hop profile. So uh, whereas it used to be 100% Summit hops all the way through on this, we use a combination of Summit and Cascade. Cascade, yeah. The malt bill on this is it's uh, pretty simple. It's just uh, you know uh, North American two row, some German rye malt yeah. and German Munich malt. So there's some spiciness in there. Yeah, like I really get the spiciness and, in the back end, like and really. And also like the, the mouth feel. I, I don't know. I mean, just every time I pour this beer, I'm just amazed, like just the the viscosity of it, the, the look of it. It's really got yeah. No, it's got a really lovely full round mouth feel, and then a lot of spiciness. But mm -hmm. it's it's not overly bitter. Yeah, you know, it's really not it's, super bitter, and yeah. it's and it's not. And considering that it's not overly like super malt forward, no, the no, fact no, that no. you don't really get a lot of heat from it is, yeah. uh, kind of blows me no, away. Actually, I think so. one thing I've been impressed with is this: is there's no, you know, some of the IPAs, or should I say, Imperial IPAs, double IPAs, have quite a bit of sweetness. I mean, mm -hmm. on top of the residual, but just even like the perception of it, regardless, like this just doesn't have that. It's, we like them a little drier and drinkable. Yeah, I know, you know? it's really, really. We don't want to make it uh, an all-day event to try to drink one of these, and, and uh, so yeah, make it make it drinkable. Throw a lot of hops in there, but use them in a way that doesn't make it uh, out of balance. But yeah, so the de yeah, so the deviant, while it's a smaller beer as far as alcohol goes, it's it's got more hops, and uh, the, the the hop aroma in this alone uh, would probably just about wash out your ability to smell anything. Uh, so I mean, you can smell, man, just opening up the top yeah, of yeah, that, yeah. it just bursts you can, out. You of kind there. of like you kind of waft. Yeah, it's like so heavily dry hopped and heavily two like pounds per barrel dry hop. Wow. Uh, so really, the interesting thing about this beer, I mean, it it, it literally did develop from a deviated batch of Dale's Pale Ale. And that's where the name comes from? It's, it's yeah. sort of like... The, the malt bill is sort of based off of uh, off of the Dale's, although a lot more uh, base malt and a higher uh, percentage of crystal malt. But then the hops, uh, hot side hops are exactly the same as Dale's Pale Ale. So we throw all the same hops, same amounts yeah. in, in on the hot side, but then we dry hop at two pounds per barrel with Got really lovely, yeah, I mean the piney... Big pine. I yeah. mean, I, this one here is, it's like crushed pine needles and citrus. <laughs> so the slogan on this, Deviant Wonder. There you go. So uh, obviously uh, it's customized the slogan for each of these. Yep. So not only is it like for 
day of running. It's like continue each batch. Has it does. Its own. And like I said, we got a guy. It's his full time gig, man. He's there in a little tiny room. It's a, pretty, <laughs> pretty much like a sensory deprivation chamber. We, he's got the internet. We pretty much keep him fed. Keep kick him a couple beers every once in a while, and he comes out with you know yeah. gold. So I mean, it's interesting that old, old Chub last. Yeah. You know, like, so, yeah, I, mean, I like to get all the hops out of the way. I mean, that, that's just the way I do it. And I, I'm by no means a, uh, uh, you know, a, an official beer server, yeah, yeah. steward, Cicerone, or sommelier. Zinkfelder, I think. Or any of that stuff. I'm just a brewer. And, and the Scotch Ale is typically made really low hop because the Scotch in Scotland, they, very, they don't use a lot of hops. Yep. One hop addition, we just throw in a little bit there in the beginning of the boil. Nothing else after that. Some, some uh, German smoke malt. Some yeah, Eng English yeah. uh, crystal, English. Uh, so it's like that beach with that beachwood smoke from from Roush. Wireman. Yeah, lovely dark. I mean, it's it's a, it's a darkest. I mean, just a quick call out too. I mean, obviously, folks that are familiar with you are familiar with Ten Fifty, uh, which is an imperial stout. Imperial uh, American stout. Yeah. Yeah, but only that's a winter beer. So we actually, you know, we're here kind of in the summer ish. So yeah, this is a year available. round beer for us. Yeah. The Ten Fifty we just do as a seasonal. Uh, the old chub. You know, this was the second beer that we ever put in a can. Uh, sort of like a cola kind of color to it. Yeah, yeah. You know, some deep burgundy. That and lovely freshness. You know, it's interesting, the contrast of these, and you get this, and it's got this, like, fresh kind of, like, meadow smelling. Like, I don't know, it's sort of interesting. Like, it's a lovely. Yeah, the malt just jumps out. I mean, you get a lot of raisins. Yeah. Like, other, like, dark, like, pitted fruit kind of uh, aromas from it. Yeah. Some smoke in there as well. Pretty mild to moderate carbonation, but also lighter body too. Like it's mm -hmm. not a like I was thinking this would be like a really rich, thick kind of beer, but it's actually quite light it's, and drinkable. And uh, that's an interesting observation on your part too, because every time we taste this, and we do daily, you know, daily tastings uh, for you know QC purposes and, and and all that, it comes off as as a uh, much more drinkable beer than what it looks like on paper. Yeah, because it's a it's a big ass beer. It, it creates a tremendous problem. <laughs> well, because what How's I do, that? no, what I do, so at the end of every show, I, I, I kind of pick my favorites. I, I mean, then, to be fair, I, I've always been like a, a huge Dale and Deviant Dales fan. I've drink those of yours the most. But this is like, I may be one of those freakish people who's going to drink this in the summer, yeah. so I'm going to call Old Chubb my favorite. Like, Excellent. I mean, your pour, cheers to that. Cheers, yeah. Your, your pour order was perfect. It kind of somehow emphasized the balance of this one like well I've always thought this is a really good dessert beer anyway yeah, and so yeah, why yeah. not have that as the last one so we're pretty much done I mean what we do is we say bye to all the folks that have been watching us and I'm hoping salivating over this rem remarkable experience to drink all these incredible beers so thanks man so cheers cheers to you again Slancha. thank you all I really appreciate it I hope you have our beer in your market if you don't now soon it's soon it's probably soon. coming at some point Minnesota so one day. At some point. At some point. All right. But uh, we're cranking along, and, and thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank folks. you.